everybody. Um, before I start, I just want to say I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to be on a stage again. This is my first public speaking gig since the whole start of the pandemic. And I couldn't ask for a better place to come to than from Business of Buttons. I've been here as an attendee a bunch of times. It's a lovely conference, lovely organisers, lovely crowd. And I'm really excited to open the day up. Now, I'm going to be discussing uh, the topic of design's midlife crisis, but before I jump in, I wanted to give everyone a bit of a quick trigger warning. As some of the topics I'm going to cover might feel a little bit kind of make you feel agitated or nervous, and in some extreme cases, you might even question your whole career, your whole existence. So if you feel a little bit easy at any point, turn off Twitter, put your head between your legs, uh, I'm, I'm sure it'll probably turn out okay. Hopefully that's got you curious, so let's get started. Um, with the current demand for designers, um, I think design is really at the peak of its influence at the moment. Teams are scaling, salaries are rising, um, and more and more designers are getting that hallowed seat at the table. When you look around, you see articles from Harvard Business Review touting that designers are new MBAs, often thanks to the rise of design thinking, which I'll come on into in a second, um, and the success of design-led companies like Airbnb. We also see things like the McKinsey uh, Design Effectiveness Report showing how much better design-led companies are than their non-design-led rivals. So it is, any, is it any wonder that designers feel on top of the world at the moment? And yet they don't. Um, in fact, when I talk to designers, they seem more stressed, more disillusioned, and more pessimistic about the state of design than ever before. What's going on here? I think one of the reasons is there's a big gap between what we've been taught to believe as designers and what we've been taught to believe about design and how the rest of the world sees us. And for many, this gap feels like it's widening rather than shrinking. Now, this starts from our own perspective of design. We've grown up a diet on a diet of lectures, books, articles, tweet storms, and yes, presentations like the ones you're going to see today that have idealised um, our view of the industry. You'll see speakers at conferences and events telling you that you too can have the perfect design environment if you just follow these simple steps. Do good product discovery. Follow the agile process. Start using OKRs. Have design principles or a team charter. Set up regular one-to-ones. And if you do all these things properly, you too will end up with a design center practice. And so we put all these things into practice, but they don't seem to work. And then we blame ourselves for maybe not being good enough. Um, we blame our colleagues um, for not being design-centred enough, um, and we blame the companies we work for for not understanding what seems obvious to all of us designers. Because we know that design lies at the heart of everything we do. And we also know that the right way to design is to follow this process where we spend as much time researching problems and coming up with a variety of solutions as we do shipping products. And we've been taught that it should be designers rather than the business who decides what gets built. So we get frustrated when we're told what to build, and we're frustrated when we don't get to do research. As designers, we've been taught that in order to design the best products possible, we need to understand the full context of what we're designing. This requires time to do research, talk to customers, run workshops, gather the big picture of the problem. And we get frustrated when we're blocked from talking to our customers or prevented from spending time exploring a dozen different options. We're user-centered, so we put the user at the heart of everything we do. And in fact, we value user needs and sentiment above all else, including often the needs of the business or the needs of our colleagues. This sets designers up as the main arbiters of ethics, and we get super frustrated when things don't go our way. In fact, I think we've come to believe in some circles at least, that this trade-off between user needs and business needs is inherently unethical, and that we regularly feel like we're the last line of defense protecting the user. Fortunately, we've been taught about the power and impact designs can have uh, if the business world would just listen. I'm sure you've all grown up on stories like Jared's uh, $300 million button, or you've read the cautionary tales of Google's 41 Shades of Blue. These stories have become a sort of industry folklore that we pass down from generation to generation. And all this underscores a set of beliefs that we hold to be true. But are they true? And are these beliefs really serving us? Or maybe they're holding us back. It's understandable why we centre UX as the most important thing in an organisation, as we truly believe what we do matters. 
It's why we choose a career in design after all, rather than, say, business, technology, or marketing. However, by centering ourselves in our own hero's journey, we position everybody that doesn't buy into our thesis as foes to be conquered or challenges to overcome. Nothing is more obvious to me in this tension than our relationship with marketing. We often see marketing as corporate shills trying to force mediocre products down people's throats. This tension is perfectly captured in the saying my friend John Wilshire coined, make things people want rather than make people want things. For a lot of designers, including myself, there's a deep sense of truth wrapped up in this sentiment. However, it also implies that what we do, make things people want, is so much more important than what those other people do, just simply making people want things, especially if they're things that people don't actually need. This sentiment can create a really toxic relationship between design and marketing, which I see in my coaching work over and over again. This also sets up a false belief that all you need to do in order to make a business successful is make a great product, and it will essentially sell itself. I call this sort of problem the field of dreams fallacy after the Hollywood movie, and it's rife in the design community. The idea that if we build an amazing product, customers will simply turn up and start using it. I've fallen for this fallacy myself many times over the years because it panders to our own sense of self-importance. However, as a startup advisor, I've seen many amazingly designed products fail to take off because the people who needed them didn't know about them or couldn't be convinced to jump over the hurdle to invest in the switching costs, you know, to, to, to sort of attack the endowment effect. Equally, I've seen some appallingly designed products that sell like hotcakes, often to the annoyance of the design team, because it actually solves a meaningful problem. The hard truth is that startups are often successful despite the quality of the early product rather than because of it, which sort of goes against everything we've been taught to believe as designers. A lot of this revolves around maturity and the maturity of the audience. If you're currently targeting early adopters, they are much more focused on removing pains, irrespective of what the experience is like. Probably because you know, the experience of doing things currently is just so much worse. So a super rough technical MVP, minimum viable product, is often enough. As the market and the product matures, you start attracting more risk-averse users. Um, and these risk-averse users are obviously looking for a slicker experience, um, especially when sort of um, customers start comparing products. And this is where quality comes in, plays an in increasingly important part. As a result, I think we need to move away from this mistaken belief that our job as designers is to create the best version of the product possible straight out of the gate, because we're almost certainly over-optimizing. Instead, our goal should be, get, should be to get the best quality product out the door as quickly as possible, so we can start delivering value as quickly as possible, so we can start checking whether the thing we've built actually is meeting the needs of the customers. And I'll come back to this concept a little bit later in the talk. The painful truth in all of this is that design doesn't really matter half as much as most designers think, especially in the early days of a product. And through my work as a startup advisor um, and an investor, I've come to realize that marketing, and particularly go-to-market strategy, often plays a much, much bigger role in the success of any early stage startup than we'd like to think. Um, although I have to also say that I think um, design is much more important than most company founders think. So this is this weird kind of duality here. Um, if we think the animosity between design and marketing is tough, then all we need to do is look at the animosity between design and product. You know, product should be our closest allies. Yet when I speak to designers, often asking them, like, where's the sort of frustration in your workflow, they usually point at product. Um, I think this is partly because product managers are much more actively engaged in the needs of the business, which means they're often much more likely to need to seek compromise. They go to the business to look for requirements. They go to the designers to try and convince them to do what they've been told to do. And this sort of battle erupts. And often, the compromises that product managers are asking designers to make does come at the cost of design. So it's really frustrating, and I understand why designers often push back against this. However, because of that, I argue that product management is probably the hardest you know, job in tech. Um, they're stuck in the middle of this impossible triangle, trying to get two groups of perfectionists to compromise in order to get something out the door and in the hands of customers um, before the company runs out of money. 
I know it's not a job that we, you know, I'd want to take, although ironically I'm seeing a lot of designers move into product management under the possibly mistaken belief that product managers have more power. Weirdly, in my experience, product managers have very little power. They just have all of the responsibility. They're told what to do. They're told to sort of deliver it. But they don't own the decision making. They don't own what the, the engineers do, what the designers do. So they're kind of in this weird sort of um, difficult position. But, but at the same time, I'm really, really pro designers looking and exploring into the product management space. I think it's interesting. And I would rather have more product design led product managers than engineering product managers or BAs in that role. I think we'll have a much better space if we have more of that going on. Now, this is hard to hear, but the reality is designers aren't at the center of everything. Actually, they aren't at the center of anything. Instead, we're servants of the business. And one of a number of groups serving the business at that, so not even the most important group. And the quicker we realize our actual role, rather than our idealized role, the quicker we can start delivering value to the business and value to our customers. Another problem is the double diamond. While it's a wonderful model, it's largely a lie. Um, in reality, design in most organizations looks a lot more like this. Very little research is actually undertaken. Very little product exploration is done. Instead, all of the efforts are focused around delivery. Now, this isn't ideal by any stretch of the imagination. I think we do need to be pushing for more discovery. I think we do need to be pushing to explore more ideas. However, if we fixate on the double diamond as the sort of the, the ideal model, we're going to be constantly disappointed. Because in all but a handful of companies, it's an unrealistic and unattainable model. And if we expect this to be the norm, we're setting ourselves up for disappointment. Just as much as if we sort of set our own experience of life or our physical presence based on what models look like, what film stars look like, what Instagram influencers look like. If we sort of fixate on this unachievable model, we're just going to feel unhappy for much of our career. I think a lot of this pressure comes from our belief that we're the voice of the customer and that any product decisions that get made outside of the design team are naturally ill-informed. Um, as Paul Adams, a good friend of mine, said a few years ago at the UX uh, London conference, which I run, we're a voice of the customer, but we're rarely the voice. Uh, in fact, we often have a lot less contact with our customers than we would like to think. We definitely have a lot less contact with our customers than maybe the people in sales, the people in customer support. So we need to do a much better job of engaging with our partners in sales and CX, especially if they have more power and influence in the organization than designers, which particularly sales teams often do. Another big frustration from designers comes from this belief that we should be deciding what gets built. And we get super frustrated when other parts of the business tell us what to build. Now, I'm not saying it wouldn't be better. I personally believe it would. Just that this isn't how most companies effectively are run. So we need to start working around these existing structures rather than being fixated on this ideal, which doesn't currently exist. As Erica Hall says, um, it doesn't matter how good your data is if you haven't done the groundwork to ensure an evidence-based framework for making decisions is in place before doing the work of gathering other evidence. I think as designers, we spend so much time fixating on doing research without realizing or putting the structure in place to allow research to be understood and informed. If that structure, that framework isn't there, all of the research we do is in vain. As a result, we often find ourselves in what's dismissively called a feature factory. We want to convey about where we have little personal agency and other parts of the organization just keep throwing in features onto the conveyor belt, which comes to us and we have to deliver. Now, this goes against everything we've been taught about design, and it's really, really frustrating. If you've ever found yourself in a company that is really working like a feature factory, you'll know what I mean. And actually, if you go and do a little search on feature factories on Twitter, it's full of designers just venting their frustration about not having any control over their workflow and their backlog. This is especially, like I say, frustrating when we're brought up to believe that it's our job, maybe even our duty, to build the best product possible. However, what we don't realize as designers is opportunity cost. Businesses want to get products in the hands of their customers as fast as possible so they can start making money as fast as possible. Um, often not because they're greedy, but because if they don't make money as fast as possible, they might go out of business, they might not survive. So there's this existential threat. So any delay to this, any delay to shipping your product, 
leaves money on the table. And this graph is a great example of how designers like to think in terms of these steps, whereas the sort of the agile mindset, the kind of business development mindset is much about pushing constant value. And the gap between the two graphs shows all of the value that this sort of design approach is leaving on the table. Now, a lot of businesses sort of bought, bought into this idea that agile would be the solution. Um, but most designers I know, including myself, don't think it is. As designers, we often find Agile to be a super frustrating process. It doesn't give us, uh, us enough time to do proper research and discovery. We rarely get to understand the broader context of the bigger picture. We want to build the best product possible, but having to ship in two-week instruments just gets in the way. For the longest time, I've personally blamed Agile for this. And if you go back to some of my tweets five, six, seven years ago, maybe longer, I was really angry at how Agile was forcing us into this you know, anti-design sort of design way of working. But I actually think it was a lot of it sort of stuck in my own kind of mistaken belief of what good design should look like. However, I'm increasingly coming around to the belief that Agile isn't the problem, although it is annoying. Um, instead, I think Agile is just incompatible with the way designers natural tendency for perfection. Um, and maybe it's this tendency that's causing us the problems, not Agile in and of itself. Um, in truth, perfect is the enemy of good. And we'll always be frustrated if we're constantly chasing some unobtainable ideal. Instead, we need to learn that our role isn't and never has been about delivering the perfect solution. Instead, our role is to ship the best solution possible within the limited time we have available. And that means we need to be faster, we need to be more pragmatic, and speed and pragmatism always trumps perfection. As Stuart Clark from Deliveroo rightly points out, Great design work at strategic level is a set of compromises rather than, than an idealized design vision. And this is the most difficult thing for senior practitioners to wrap their heads around when moving from a practitioner role into a leadership role. And I coach a lot of design leaders and they really, really get stuck with this because they think their role is to ship the perfect thing. And it's only when they hit that leadership level that they realize, oh no, this is not my job at all. And why is it problematic? because it goes counter to everything we've been taught. It goes counter to everything we've learned. And worse, because often our focus on good, our focus on quality, is the reason we got to the point we are in our career today. If you got to being a, a principal designer or a staff designer, you got there because you care about quality. Then jumping into a leadership role where you have to make decisions which cut quality is really tough. So the thing we need to learn, though, and I think this is true for most careers, is what got us to where we are today won't necessarily get us to where we need to go tomorrow. And actually, it might sabotage our efforts. So we need to be constantly learning. We need to be flexible. We need to try new things. Probably more importantly, chasing perfection is a risk to our own mental health and our collective well-being. I can't tell you the number of designs that I've seen a design team um, ship what I think is an amazing product, a product that maybe you know, solves 80% of all the problems that were there, but there's sort of 20% of problems still on the table. And they didn't get to ship the problems, but hey, look, it's so much better. And you would expect that in this instance, people would be really happy, really excited about the work they did. And yet, when I talk to the designers, they're depressed, they're bummed out. They're so fixated on the 20% that didn't ship that they forget about the 80% that did. As such, launch day often feels more like a wake than a celebration in a design team. Um, and the weird thing is, this doesn't get better. I see design teams, you know, after two or three or four big launches, where you think they would be happy, just getting more and more depressed. This sort of little cloud comes over them thinking, it's impossible to do good design here, I'm going to have to move on. Why should we even bother? This company doesn't care about value, they don't care about design. And I'm looking at this thing and going, but it's so much better than was there before. Our customers will love it. So this is gap, I think. You know, we need to start focusing on the 80% we ship, not the 20% that is in our minds that would have made it perfect. And this is one of the sort of the sentiments that led me to this belief that design is suffering from some kind of existential crisis. Many of the things we've been taught to believe about the world, and particularly about the world of design, have just failed to materialize. Some have even been proven not to be true. We're not at the center of the design process. We're not doing enough design research. We're not driving product discovery. And we're unhappy with the quality of the work that we do produce. 
Under these circumstances, is it any wonder why so many designers I speak to feel confused, frustrated, and a little bit lost? And are starting to question the direction they've taken in life, the decisions they've made, and the value of what they do. This sounds a little bit to me like a midlife crisis. Now here's a classic list of the symptoms of a midlife crisis. And I'm speaking to a lot of designers at the moment who are experiencing one or more of these symptoms. Feeling like design hasn't lived up to their expectations and questioning where to go next. Questioning the role design has played in society and wanting to make a bigger impact on the world. Feeling a little lost and listless in their career. Feeling nostalgic for how the web was 10 years ago. I'm sure we can all feel that. Um, and feeling a little bit time like it might be time to switch careers. Hmm, maybe I should become a PM after all. Um, I felt this sense of personal ennui most viscerally at a conference called Interaction 17 in, in New York City. Trump had just been elected on a wave of social media hatred. Mint's information was spreading like wildfire. And people were worried about tech addiction. And every third talk was about design's responsibility and the ethics of design. It was like the whole interaction community has suddenly taken a long, hard look at itself and found it wanting. I felt a similar sense of ill ease during the Black Lives Matter protests you know, a year or so ago. Designers waking up to the systematic and institution biases that have been plagued in, you know, plaguing the tech space and baked into tech and beginning to question their role in technology, what they've done to kind of bring this sort of world forward. It's natural for people and industries, I think, to go through some kind of midlife crisis, to look back over their careers, to understand the impact they've had on the world and what they'll be leaving for future generations. I think the same is happening of our industry. While a lot of people experience midlife crises, look forward to spirituality, look about the sort of big fundamental questions in life, I think the design industry has looked towards the field of ethics um, to help them provide some kind of framework to unpack their own decisions and to make sense of the impact they've had on the world. How can we use design and our design skills to have more impact, more positive impact on the world around us? How can we avoid baking bias into the systems we create? How can we push back when we're asked to do things we feel uncomfortable with, like deploying dark patterns? Thankfully, my friend Harry Brignall that coined the term dark patterns has been very much involved in European legislation to make dark patterns illegal, which is, is fantastic. And actually, you see, I think, uh, California has a bunch of legislation in place also making certain dark patterns. I think the, uh, the dark pattern around forcing people who subscribed online to unsubscribe on a telephone, I think that might be illegal in California now. Um, so... We want to learn how we can create more equity in, in our work and how to avoid creating vectors for abuse. Um, these are some of the questions I think the design industry has been thinking about quite deeply for the last few years. There are tons of interesting people out there writing about this space, talking about this space, so I encourage you to follow some of the people who are working on design ethics. In fact, you know, we have Kat speaking um, later today, amazing kind of speaker on, on the, the topic of design ethics. We also have, uh, we also have Leila, who's also going to be talking about kind of using design to make disruptive change. And even sort of Jared Spall will be touching on you know, the theme I mentioned earlier about what got us here isn't necessarily going to take us there. Um, now, one way designers have been approaching this problem is to learn the language of business in order to have more influence um, and how, you know, influence of how the work gets done, how the decisions get made. And I'm seeing a slow and steady number of designers undertaking MBAs for this very reason. I think there's a lot to be said for designers gaining more fluency in business. In fact, I think it's one of the reasons why I've spent the last sort of six months, nine months, um, helping business leaders and exploring the venture capital space, the investing space. Not only do we need more designers on the boards of companies, but we need more designers starting companies, we need more designers funding companies, we need more designers advising companies. I think a lot of the time us designers join teams when it's too late. If we go and join a five or six person design team, the culture's already set. If we go and become the first designer the company's ever hired, we get to set the culture. And also, if we become founding designers, we are working directly with the CEO, we're teaching the CEO helping them understand about the impact design can have. If we join three, four, five years into the journey, we probably won't get that level of exposure and we won't have that level of influence. Interestingly, if you're interested in the VC space, if you're thinking about starting your own business, or if you're thinking of maybe becoming an angel investor, or just want to work in the tech you know, space as a founding designer, come and chat to me afterwards. I'm happy to give you some advice. Um, so. One of the reasons people are doing MBAs is because we need to speak the language of business. 
And this is why I'm intrigued by Anna's talk later, because she's going to be talking about kind of a feeling that a lot of designers have been expressing of late. This idea of like design thinking being somehow wrong, somehow bad. However, when designers push back against design thinking, we run the risk of ceding control over to the MBAs, people who have just got a six weeks course in design and then suddenly think they can represent the whole design industry. And we put ourselves in a box that says design doing. So one of the reasons why I push back against the pushback against design thinking is I don't want to paint designers in the corner. I want us to be part of those conversations rather than giving control over to the MBAs. One of the interesting things you discover when you spend time hanging around with business people is actually how aligned their thinking is to what we believe. MBAs teach the importance of understanding user needs, of delivering products that meet or exceed customer expectations. These are all the things that we care about. The main problem is most executives just don't realize they have somebody in their organization that cares about these things as well, that's been trained to do these things. They think designers mostly are you know, people that make things look nice. And to be honest, we're at blame here because we've been pretty bloody terrible at communicating this. And when we push back against design thinking, we're saying, us designers, we're just the design doing people. Design thinking is not important. So us designers need to do a better job at building relationships with our execs, demonstrating to them how we think, demonstrating to them the value we can deliver, um, and more importantly, explain to them how design can help them achieve their goals. However, the majority of execs don't want to have some designer educating them about the benefits of design. In fact, it can come off as quite patronizing and antagonizing more often than anything else. I, a lot of my coaching clients want to have me help them coach how they can teach their bosses that design is the right way. That's the wrong approach, trust me. In fact, often, more often than not, it backfires. As Daniel Berker elo el eloquently explained, um, we need to stop trying to sell design and instead trying to demonstrate the value design can have on other people. This doesn't require us to sit an MBA. It just requires us to use our own research skills and our business partners, learn what they truly value, and help them achieve their, their, their goals through the medium of design. And what do they value? It's not rocket science. Most businesses only really care about these five things. I'm going to take a little glass of water while you ponder these five things and think about how they all reflect what we do as designers. These are things that designers can directly influence. Acquisition, retention, all of these things are in our power. And yet we often see control over to marketing. So often I see marketing, growth marketers focusing on all these areas and design has an increasingly small kind of field to play in. We're just the people that makes the tool. We don't involve ourselves in how it's used, how it's you know, monetized, how it's grown. Um, this means moving organizations' perception of design from a cost center to a profit center. By demonstrating, for instance, that for every dollar your company spends on design, they get $5 back. Now, this may seem whimsical, maybe even theoretical, but this is exactly how my friend Stuart Frisbee grew the Booking.com design team from five people to 100 people in five years. He did a few little tests, and he proved to the management team that for every dollar you spent on design, they got $5 back. If you are a CEO, if you are a department head, and you know there's this easy way of making money, I put $1 here, six months later or a year later, it turns into $5, why would you not want to invest in design? This is our job to prove that. Businesses generally look at designers on the execution level because this is how we talk and behave. We talk and behave like executors. When we go and pitch meetings, we don't talk about the business value that we're doing, we talk about the process that we did. Often I've sat through meetings where 20, 30 minutes the designer is sitting there talking about all the fonts and colors and processes and examples and blah, 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 blah. And the, you know, the CEOs are loving it because they get a little you know, afternoon off and they get to look at pretty pictures. Very rarely do I see a designer pitch and go, don't worry about how we've done this. This is the business goal we're trying to achieve. This is how we've achieved it. This is going to be the result. Bang. If you do something like that, you're going to get your executive's attention very, very quickly. It's not just going to be an afternoon of looking at pretty pictures. So we need to stop having this executor's mindset and move into this sort of mindset of, of, of delivering business value. I think one of the problems is a lot of designers sort of live in this world of abundance. We know that if we were giving the perfect amount of time, the perfect amount of money, we would deliver the perfect product. 
And when we aren't given the perfect amount of time and they aren't given the perfect amount of money, we get frustrated because we look at the thing that could have been. By comparison, most business people live in a world of limited resources and competing demands. We're going out of business permanently. It's just around the corner. As such, there's no point investing in huge initiatives because you might not be around long enough to see them succeed or, or feel the benefit. As such, most businesses look to make a lot of small bets, knowing full well that most of those bets will fail, and doubling down on the ones that look like they're getting some traction. This is in stark contrast to most designers who want to de-risk the product or the project by doing as much research and exploration as possible, validating ideas before launch. Now, I'm not saying this is wrong. I'm a designer. I love this stuff. Only that it's difficult to do in the context of limited resources. Ultimately, I think as designers, we feel like we're playing a game of chess. The rules are known. It just takes you know, resources, time, and brain power, and we can solve this puzzle. But most executives aren't playing a game of chess. They're playing a round of hands of poker. And with this, they don't care if, you know, 40% of the hands fail, as long as, you know, or actually 60 or 70% of the hands fail, as long as the ones that succeed, succeed big. So we need to sort of reprogram our brain to stop playing chess and start playing poker. And a lot of this comes down to budget and opportun opportunity costs. Getting something out of the door quickly starts driving revenue sooner. Most businesses see sales and marketing as the drivers of revenue. So in order for designers to be seen to add more value, not just being a cost to be managed, we need to demonstrate that we have a role to play in driving revenue. This is one of the reasons why I'm personally um, fascinated by the area of growth design. If any of you have kind of sort of explored this space, the growth design community is wonderful. It's a group of designers who, rather than looking sort of during the long-term process of, a, of the lifetime of a product, are looking at kind of like small incremental improvements. How can we tweak this here? How can we move that there? Growth designers tend to be a little bit more hackery. They tend to be a little bit more analytics-focused. They tend to be a little bit more dev-focused. Um, so rather than carving out huge chunks of the product, they're mostly focused on optimizing those five things, the, the pirate metrics of acquisition, retention, recommendations, etc. Um, and there's a ton of great books out there if you're interested in learning about growth design. Just do a little Google on Amazon search for, for growth design, and you'll see a bunch of stuff there. So what does this all mean for the field of design? Well, first off, I think we need to stop complaining about design not being understood. I think we need to stop finding excuses and blaming others, like marketing, sales, or product management. And instead, we need to take an active role in raising the profile and impact of design. To do this, we need to stop entering our, or centering ourselves in the conversation, as this comes across as quite kind of self-centered, egotistical, and needy. We are not in the center of everything. We're sort of out to the side, serving the wider business. We're one of a number of supporting cast members. We're not the lead member. As Paul Adams rightly says, the next evolution of UX requires us to understand where we sit in the organization and the role we play. And we need to stop fixating over these idealized processes or worrying that we're doing it wrong, but rather accept the current reality. That doesn't mean not pushing for change. I'm not suggesting that we all sit back and just kind of accept the status quo, but just realize that status quos are first there for a reason, and we can apply our design research skills to understand that, and they take time to move. And so it's this delta gap between how fast the system is moving and how fast we're moving. And we need to stop beat beating ourselves up over what we deliver. We need to be prouder. We need to celebrate what we do rather than sort of behaving like when we give, do a big launch, something's gone wrong. And we need to do a much, much better job of demonstrating the value design can bring. And we need to do that by showing rather than telling. We need to demonstrate this through metrics and KPIs rather than a, a beautiful, convincing deck that we, we present to our CEO going, well, this is why design matters. We need to show, we need to back it up. And also, we need to realize that this is not a one-stop shop. We're on a journey. When we think about the product that we're designing, I think a lot of designers, like I say, think that the, the first iteration needs to be the perfect thing, or at least it needs to be 90% there. We need to start thinking that products are going to be lasting 5, 10, 15, 20 years. These products are going to last much, much longer than we're going to be in the company. 
And this is how the, the, the bosses, this is how the CEOs are thinking about the products. They're thinking about the products in their life cycle. So if we're coming and joining that journey for a short period of time, we need to realize that we're not going to be able to change everything and make everything perfect in, in a year or two or three. But what we can do is we can make it a damn sight better, and we can demonstrate how design has added to the value that we're generating. And if we can do all this, um, we'll not only have earned our seat at the table, but hopefully it will be a grown-up's hide, you know, regular chair rather than a baby's chair. Um, so on that note, I am a couple of minutes early, so uh, thank you very much.